All right, a lot of things to talk about in the world of sports, from both from the world of football to the world of basketball. And not forgetting the African Games going on in Ghana, Accra, and the city. Of course, a lot of events that have gone down already and lots to look forward to when it comes to uh, the African Games. I'm not alone in the studio. I've got a fine gentleman this uh, morning, Okpe Adibari. Uh, good morning to you. Welcome. Thank you, Fever. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, Sunday, look different from Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Try to keep it holy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll be doing this together in the next uh, few minutes uh, today. And we'll be starting with our top five stories making headlines in the world of sport. And starting, of course, from the world of uh, football in Africa, talking about the Africa Cup of uh, Nations. You just concluded Africa Cup of Nations has received a lot of boost as uh, the Confederation of African Rep uh, Football, CAF, has reported a significant increase in revenue generated from the successful 2023 Africa Cup of Nations. CAF has, lauded, uh, CAF, CAF has been lauded for putting up a great tournament in the Ivory Coast, and now the numbers back those sentiments with a significant increase in every aspect of the tournament. Now, the Continental Governing Body posted a 21% increase in commercial revenue from the tournament, which, of course, were projected to have hit 75 million US dollars, while ticketing revenue jumped 81%. And uh, this was largely boosted by the increase in sponsors with the 2023 tournament attracting uh, up to uh, 17, up from 10, that supported the 2021 edition stage in Cameroon two years ago. And CAF was also able to break into the new market with a record number of viewership that hit 2.2 billion views on all digital platforms. I mean, okay, that's a big one for CAF. The, uh, right now, they are counting their, you know, uh, their harvest, and one of it is uh, the revenue they've made from the just concluded African Cup of Nations. Definitely. It was a great spectacle. I think one of the best I've witnessed in a long time. And the best thing about it was that the whole of the world was paying attention. That's why I love the January timing of um, the African Cup of Nations for me, because no other major tournament is really going on at that point in time. Some will argue that the Premier League is on... Uh, the other leagues in Europe competing for the, uh, for the African competition? Definitely, those competitions are on, but the marquee thing for me was 2.2 billion viewers. That says a lot. So irrespective of the major leagues that were going on, everyone wanted to see what was going on in Africa. And I think one major thing was the good preparation by Ivory Coast. They pushed it back by one year, and I think it was worth it at the end of the day. All right, it was worth it at the end of the day. I think one interesting thing that I also you know, witnessed while in Cote d'Ivoire is the fact that while the Premier League was on, and uh, other leagues in Europe, AFCON trended from the beginning of the tournament till the end of the tournament, irrespective of whatever activities in the world of football in Europe, especially for lovers of uh, the Premier League. Anyway, from there now to our next top story. This time around, still talking football. Uh, we also go straight uh, to the next one. We, of course, uh, Ghana will be without athletic Bilbao star striker Inaki Williams for the upcoming international friendlies against Nigeria and Uganda next week. The 29-year-old was missing out of the 26-man squad named for Otto Ado for the international friendlies to be played in Morocco. There were other notable absentees in the call-up, such as Inaki Williams, Richard Ofori, Joseph Pencil, and Majid Ashemeru. Despite these omissions, the squad still boasts a strong lineup with plenty of talent and experience to draw upon Otto Ado named for debutants, Frederick Asari, Nathaniel Aje, Mohamed Diomande, uh, Ibrahim Osman in his squad for the international friendlies and the Black Stars will be looking to put on a good performance against the Super Eagles of Nigeria and Uganda as they continue their preparations for future competitions. I mean, Black Stars of Ghana, the coach has started work already. And one of it is to release the squad for the upcoming friendlies. I mean, they have a shepherd, you know, right there in, in the shipboard. In Aki Williams, a big miss. For the Black Stars? Definitely a big mix, but they've got a lot of talent in there. You've got Semenyo who plays for Bournemouth, you've got um, Jordan Ayu who plays the street Crystal Palace, and then you have some top wingers and top attackers. Mohamed Kudus is still in the mix. You've got Yisha Wu from um, Leicester City as well. And then oh, I think we've got um, Pantil that plays for uh, LA Galaxy right now, who's also in the team. So yeah, they've got a lot of attackers. So missing Inaki Williams may be the aspect of the hold up play, but aside that, Ghana can play in different ways, but most especially looking forward to that game against Nigeria, you know they'll be looking forward to a win to make a mark. I, I mean, uh, the bands on, on X, of and course, not of forgetting course. the rivalry between the Ghana Jollof, the Nigerian Jollof. <laughs> it will I be mean, back again. It will be back again. Looking all, forward to it. All right, we're looking forward to it. I mean, it promises to be exciting come next weekend. That's, of course, uh, in the world of football. 
Away from there now to our next top story. This time around, athletics mixed with football as Jamaican sprint queen Shelly Ann Fraser Price, renowned for her lightning speed and unwavering uh, determination on the track, has not only dominated the world of athletics but has also become a beacon of inspiration and support for her community. And this week, she demonstrated her commitment to uplifting young athletes by making a significant donation to the Olympic Garden Football Club in Jamaica. The donation, which included crucial gear and supplies, was not just a gesture of generosity, but of course a testament to Fraser Price's uh, uh, deep-rooted connection to her roots. And of course, hailing from nearby Waterhouse community herself, she understands firsthand the challenges and dreams of young athletes striving for success against the odds. The Olympic Gardens Football Club, nestled within the heart of the Olympic Gardens at its cling, cling over, stands for a symbol of hope and opportunity for aspiring athletes. I mean, this is massive from uh, Shelly Ann Fraser Price. We know her that uh, she's used to athletics. And what would, you know, also look at the motive behind this, not just giving back to our community, but going to another sport aside athletics. Definitely. I think the first thing is that she sees herself as a beacon of hope, just like every other person sees her, especially in Jamaica. She, for me, she's exemplary, not just for women, but for men as well. I think being one athlete who actually took a time out to have kids come back to the game and come back even better and stronger meant a lot to a lot of women and then uh, obviously sports lovers worldwide. But then going the extra mile, knowing that you have a responsibility for young, young athletes, for the future and then going back there giving back to them obviously that will mean a lot to the athletes and the footballers in particular giving them important gear which will help them new soccer boots hoses and um, shin pads it meant a lot to them and they were very grateful all right they were very grateful and wanting to note of course when it comes to the country of jamaica they are not used to playing football yes they have a football team the women the men's uh, but uh, maybe that could just be like a boost to tell them aside athletics we could also you know impact the world in the world of football right there in jamaica well, interestingly it was Shelly and Fraser Price. Maybe this, of course, uh, would spur other athletes in the country, in the world, to take uh, you know, a look at other sports and try to also send their support and not just the sport they participate in. All right, away from there now to our next top story. This time around, of course, still talking sports. We'll go straight uh, to athletics where disgraced Botswana's uh, former Olympic 800-meter silver medalist, Nigel Amos, will release his documentary titled From Morobella to the world in August. And now Amos is currently serving a three-year doping ban handed to him last May. Now, over the use of the banned substance, GW1516, having been provisionally suspended in July 2022 after failing the drug test during an out-of-competition test a month earlier. Now, the documentary promises to be a compelling exploration of Amos' extraordinary journey from his humble beginnings in Morobella to becoming a silver medalist at the 2012 London Olympics with a narrative that encompasses the highs of athletic achievements. Now, the challenges, of course, of the doping crisis and the dramatic saga surrounding his Olympic medal, the film offers a comprehensive look into Amos' life and career. Now, despite his ban, despite what he's facing, he's hoping to release a documentary. Some might even say, I mean, why release a documentary? Some might even want to question a lot of things. But this young man is looking forward to, against all laws, against what is happening at the moment, come out with a film. And we don't know exactly what it took, you know, which, which will entail, but we know that he wants to release a film uh, in the window of his band. Definitely. I, I think it's all about a rebrand for him. He has gone through a period where he has been disgraced, not just nationally, but internationally as well. Because, I mean, from the 2012 Olympics, the spotlight was on him. Honestly, he's a great athlete. Um, and he showed a great moment of sportsmanship, which would forever be cherished in the world of athletics and sports. You know, during one of his 800 meters events, he, um, the, the athlete in front of him tripped him. They f he fell. And then together, they finished the race together. And then, you know, he, had, he has such a good personality that is loved in the world of athletics. The doping ban was something, was, it was a huge blow to his career. But then when you think about it, it was a period where he was inactive and then he had not been winning, he was competitive, he had not been winning medals in a while. So obviously it might have affected him and that caused him to slip into, I mean, it, it's not well, justification, but he's human at the end of the day. But, and it's but, a reminder that that's It's surprising that when it comes to doping issues, you look at Kenya as a country that is on the A-list category and not also forgetting Nigeria too, but... It's ignorant, they say it's not an excuse in the, when it comes to uh, the law. I mean, you have the list of drugs prohibited 
a substance prohibited by WADA, WADA Tidopia Agency, yeah. but he went ahead to take drugs that had that particular substance. So it's nobody's fault. Definitely, but then maybe in the movie we'll understand why. But I think okay. the only the only excuse, and this excuse is, isn't even tangible because okay. it was out of competition during that period. But then when you take a look at Dopini, if we just want to highlight on it a bit, I think these athletes face a lot of pressure from family members and themselves, but also the coaches and aids around them. Sometimes because they've seen them do um, be successful in the past, All they right. want to see them reach those heights again, <laughs> and one or two things happen. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll wait to see what happens. And when the film uh, comes out, we'll be able to tell what it entails. And now to wrap up our top five stories, we we'll go straight to the world of uh, rugby. And this time around, uh, we hear that Wales have rejected coach Warren Garland's uh, offer to resign after the finished bottom of the Six Nations standings for the first time in 21 years, following a 24-2-1 defeat to Italy in Cardiff for Saturday. For Saturday. By the way, Gatland said he remains committed to taking Wales to the 2027 World Cup in Australia, despite offering to step down. And of course, according to him, I quote, he said, yes, absolutely, I have made a commitment. Uh, I just said to Abby Tierney, who is the Welsh rugby chief executive, in the changing room, that if you want me to resign, I'm quite happy to do that. Now, she said, like, hell, I mean, that's the last thing I want to do. And that's why I'm really afraid of Gatland, of Gatland remains of Gatland. By the way, Gatland remains convinced his young squad are moving in the right direction despite a disappointing campaign where they failed to win a game and claimed the wooden spoon. Now, when you look at the world system, especially in the part of Africa, when it comes to the world of sport, when the coach is not doing well, there are clamors for the coach to be sacked. In fact, the, uh, the body responsible for hiring these managers do not take waste any much time to sack these managers. But in the case of Will, they are saying, we still believe in you. Don't go. Stay with us. I mean, surprising. Yeah, but definitely, if we take a look at Will's, in other aspects of sports as well, they have long-term leaders. Because in terms of their own products, in terms of Welsh coaches and Welsh trainers, they don't have a lot of them. And honestly, Gatland is someone who has a good track record, okay. especially with the Welsh national team. They've been successful in the past. But obviously, this last couple of years, it's been bumpy and rocky, but they want to get back into that competitive nature and that competitive, um, should I say, arena where they, are, where they are competing with the likes of New Zealand, England, and Australia and get back to probably being and world champions. South Africa, of so. course, definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to see how it goes for the Wellish rugby team. That wraps it up on our top five stories. We have more for you after this break. Welcome back. You're still watching In The Game on New Central TV and favor it to our Ongot Okpe Adibari in the studio. Now let's go straight to the world of basketball. That's a, a tournament that went down, of course, not too long from now. It was called uh, the West African Basketball Classics that involved basketball clubs from West Africa. Uh, you know, the likes of uh, Giddy Giants, Quara Falcons of Nigeria, not forgetting Aspak of Benin Republic. Swallows of Togo and GRE Braves of Ghana. Now, they made a trip to the Togolese capital for the championship, which, of course, held at the start of mini sport. Now, Nigeria representative of the, at the 2023 Basketball Africa League, Quara Falcons finished the face on the third spot with two wins, two defeats, while Aspak of the Republic, managed by the former Nigeria uh, national team coach, Adiremi Adewumi, won three, losing one, and claiming second spot. But, of course, it was all about Giddy Giants, who won the first face, that's, of course, phase one, and we'll be preparing for the second phase that will, come, uh, will uh, go down later this year, of course, in the month of uh, April. An organizer spearheaded by Nigeria Olumide Oyedeji expressed satisfaction with this particular tournament. And now uh, to discuss extensively what went down in West African basketball uh, classics is a basketball pundit, of course, a sports journalist based in uh, Kwara State, Nigeria. Bolaji Lawal joins us this morning. Good morning to you, Bolaji Lawal. Good to have you on in the game. Uh, good morning, favorite. It's always a pleasure joining you on the show. All right, let's quickly go straight to business. The West African Basketball Classics has come and gone. The first phase, Giddy Giants. Uh, a name when it comes to basketball in Nigeria, it's not so you know uh, big like what we have with Kwara Falcons, Oluyole Warriors, and not forgetting, of course, Rivers Hoopers. But they were uh, tops of phase one. Take us down. Uh, take us through what went down, of course, in Togo. Yes, uh, like you said, the first phase of the West African Basketball Classic ended in Togo about two to uh, three weeks back. And like you said, uh, Giddy Giants 
the one at the first base. Like, you know, Gidija, they are not a well-known name as far as Nigerian basketball is concerned. But for the first base, I think they came fully prepared and uh, they were able to actually uh, win that particular one. For Kuala Falcons also, they participated in that one. And unfortunately, they uh, couldn't uh, win the first base. They played uh, out of the four games they played. They won two and they lost two. They, uh, they won against uh, GRE Prince of Ghana and Swallows of Togo. But they lost against uh, Giddy Giant and Aspaka Basketball Club of uh, Benin uh, Republic. We have two other teams that also participated in Aspark, uh, GRE Braves of uh, uh, Ghana, and also Swallows of Togo. According to the organizers, headed by Olumide uh, Oyedeji, and also we have individuals from Togo, Ghana, and Benin Republic that okay. came together to organize this particular championship. The main reason why this particular championship is being put together is to ensure that uh, West African basketball are uh, teams are, are engaged with our basketball activities. When you take a look at uh, what is happening in the Nigerian basketball scene, apart from uh, the Nigerian Premier League and uh, the UCDM Championship, we don't really have any other uh, competition that can get our teams uh, you know, busy before the Nigerian uh, Basketball Premier League. So that's the major reason why the organizers decided to put this together. And uh, from what we be, from what we saw from the first phase, I think it will definitely improve as our time uh, goes on. And uh, right. for the uh, for the teams, I think uh, from the next phase, I think they will be fully prepared from what they've been able to see so far from the first phase. All right, talking about full preparation, we all know that at the moment, the Nigerian Basketball League is not ongoing. Now, you look at Quara Falcons as a team that uh, will require you know much of preparations. Giddy Giants, they're not even in the Nigerian Basketball League at the moment. So how will these teams prepare for the second phase? And what is the motivating factor in this particular tournament? Having to get teams from West Africa come together to play basketball. What is that? Uh, what, what are they looking forward to qualify for a major event? Or what is that motivating factor that, has really, that, that one should look forward to when it comes to uh, the West African Basketball Classics? Well, first, the motivating factor is the fact that, you know, they get to, you know, play with other African teams within the West African region. Like I said earlier, this is the first time in recent years that we'll be having teams from Nigeria, Pinot Republic, uh, Togo, and Ghana come together for a particular championship. Though we have something like that in the Lucidem Championship, but for the Lucidem Championship, is uh, basically a Nigerian tournament which extended our invitations to other teams. But for the West African Basketball Classic. Uh, this is a championship for West African teams, and uh, according to the organizers, by the next edition, they are looking to extend the number of teams. Why for this year, after the first phase, which ended in Togo, the second phase will be in, being in Republic, the third phase will be in Ghana, and the grand finale of the event okay. will be played in Nigeria. The, the grand finale of the event will be held in N N Nigeria later in the year, and the winner of that particular championship will get to represent Africa at a particular championship in China later in the year. All right, uh, interesting one from uh, the organizers, and of course what uh, the West African continent is doing when it comes to the world of basketball. Now let's go straight to the Basketball Africa League. Yesterday being Saturday, we had a game that went down at Cape Town Tigers. Uh, stunned Angola's uh, Petro de Luanda, 85 to 78 points in Pretoria to set up a dream finale today when they play Morocco's FES Rabat in the last game of the Kalahari Conference. Now, it was a dramatic turnaround for the Tigers who had lost their previous games in the series coming into action at the Sunbet Arena on Saturday. Now, Billy Persson led the Tigers charge, weighing in 20 points, 11 rebounds, and great contribution, of course, from Dale and Whitbread. And not forgetting Siba Yoni. Big surprise win and, of course, an upset when it comes to basketball in Africa. Now, uh, Bolaji, let's look at this right now. Petro de Luanda were tipped favorite to win that particular game, but it was not uh, what happened. And uh, we saw what, uh, what went down. And we were having an interesting finals come later today. What do you make of yesterday's game? And uh, what should we look forward to when, uh, of course, the Tigers take on uh, FES Rabat of Morocco? Yes, it was uh, definitely a surprise win for uh, the Cape Town Tigers of uh, South Africa yesterday against uh, their opponent. For me, it was an interesting game, and uh, for Cape Town, uh, Cape Town Tigers, with that win, I think uh, they still have a chance of you know making it to uh, the next phase of the competition with uh, their final game coming up today against Arabat of Morocco. I think uh, that particular game would decide the second team that will make it out of that particular group. 
But as it stands for me, I think our Petro de Luanda will definitely qualify, uh, judging by what has happened so far in the group. And the second team that may likely make it out of that group is between Cape, uh, Town, uh, Cape Town Tigers and uh, Rabat. But for me, judging with the standard of what we've seen so far, I think uh, Rabat, Rabat looks good to you know, progress to the next round of the competition by the end of today's uh, game. Okay. All right, my colleague, uh, Okpe, has a question for you. All right, Bolaji, um, thank you so far. Analysis has been brilliant. But looking forward to the final, um, we know Robert has been in good form. But then who are the other standout players to look out for in, from both teams, actually? Hello, can you come again? Who are the standout players to look out for from both teams going into the final today? Hello? Bolaji, can you hear me? Hello? Hello. Okay, uh, Bola Jilawa, I think he's asking uh, who are the players to look forward to uh, ahead of uh, today's final involving uh, the Tigers and uh, FUS Rabat. All right, we lost uh, the connection uh, with Bola Jilawa. We've been speaking to him, uh, talking about basketball in West Africa and not forgetting the Basketball Africa League. I mean, it's really going every now and then. Since it started, it, it looked like uh, a tournament that one would just say, oh, at the beginning it was still very young, but it's becoming so big in Africa that every team in Africa wants to be part of the Basketball African League. Definitely. If, if you're not part of the Basketball African League, then what other major tournaments in Africa do you want to be a part of? And for basketballers in Africa, they always look forward to tournaments to keep them motivated, to keep them, um, should I say, in good form and in check. Because when, when it gets to the Olympics, it's always a problem. When African teams face our opponents, you just see ridiculous score lines. And then there's a great difference when it comes to quality and then... It's just obvious. But then if you keep competing regularly, iron sharpen iron, you will bring out the best of these players. Keep in mind that not all of these basketball players ply their trade in Europe. You've got some basketball players who still remain locally. So how do you then want to, um, should I say, upgrade the level of quality? That's why in, most, in recent years, we have more foreign-based players taking over these teams. But now, yeah. okay. with the Basketball African League, you can have a few players coming in from the local teams. All right, uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, the fixtures to expect today when it comes to the Basketball Africa League. Yes, of course, on your screens, FES Rabat will take on Cape Town. And that, of course, will be in the home ground of the Cape Town in South Africa, hoping that uh, the uh, fans would uh, turn up for Cape Town to support them to victory. But uh, don't take anything away from FES Rabat. They're a fantastic side when it comes to the world of basketball. But upsets are indeed bound to happen. All right, away from basketball, now let's go straight to Ghana and talk about the African Games, where Nigeria increased their tally on the medals table. We're talking about arm wrestling uh, on Saturday, the medal hall for Team Nigeria at the, just, at the ongoing uh, African Games continued in arm wrestling event on Saturday as Nigeria's Sarah Matthew won two gold medals in the left and uh, right arm arm wrestling 70 kilogram class, while Olubisi Oyewusi won gold in the women's 80 kilog uh, kilogram right hand wrestling and Samuel Ifai Nemeka won two bronze medals in the left and right hand men's 85 kilogram arm wrestling. Our team Nigeria has now won a total of 13 medals in the arm wrestling uh, event, helping Nigeria maintain its position. That's it on your screen. Uh, four gold for Nigeria in arm wrestling, two silver and seven bronze. Okay, this is the debut, uh, it's debut tournament for arm wrestling and Nigeria is not even looking like it's just it's the first time they are really doing as if they should be having arm wrestling every now and then <laughs> in, in Africa and of course the world stage. Definitely. When it comes to combative events and f fully physical events, Nigerians are there. Wrestling, Taekwondo, Judo, and now arm wrestling. So it's good to see. And I think most importantly for me, I'm glad that more events are coming up where you would see Nigeria shooting up the medal table. Thankfully, athletics starting on Monday, and with those events to come, I'm sure we'll finish in a much better place at the end of the tournament. All right, a much better place. And talking about athletics, let's let you know that it will go down on Monday. And the Minister of Sports in Nigeria, uh, the man talking about uh, John Owaino, is charging the athletes to ensure that they light up the tracks. Now, the 2023 African Games enter a new week. Anticipation is high for a thrilling display of athleticism, particularly in the track and field events. Now, with a, formidable, with a formidable contingent of 54 athletes, Nigeria is poised to make a significant impact in the event taking place in Accra. 
leading the charge for Nigeria is Nigerian order than Toby Loba and Muson and the world record order in 100 meter hurdles event. And Amuson's unrivaled dominance on the continent is said to be extended as she seeks further to solidify her legacy in African athletics. I mean, athletics starting on Monday. The Minister of Sports is already in Ghana to chair the athletes to victory. That's a big motivation coming from the uh, sports minister. And of course, talking about the athletes who will be competing come tomorrow. Definitely. And I think that just goes to show you how much we, should I say, we value the African Games. This, this, Afri this particular African Games has been said to be, should I say, a precursor to the Olympics. Uh, for, for a good number of events, the Nigerian team will be seeding out athletes that will represent Nigeria at the Olympics, irrespective of um, some of the foreign-based athletes who were not able to make it. But I mean, having big names like Toby Amuson coming is a positive, honestly. And then it also uh, it will send a message to other foreign athletes, um, other Nigerian foreign athletes based in different countries that look, okay. at the end of the day, you need to give um, credence to the country whenever you're called upon. Yes, this might not be, some people will say maybe this is a distraction just before the Olympics, but it's a good tester. It's, it's a good way to know um, how the, the relating is also going to be as well. And obviously, it, it's a good spectacle, not just for Nigerians, but for the whole of Africa. All right, for the whole of Africa. Toby Loba Amuson, one name you always mention when it comes to the medals table. Let's not also forget AC Brume in long jump. We also have Ruth Tussoro. Uh, she is also going to be uh, participating uh, in uh, the long jump event. And that's also a big news for Nigeria. Not also forgetting the tracks. Uh, Patience of Kun George, a veteran in the 400 meters. Yeah. Not forgetting Edusi Badin, who looks like yeah, Alexander Lacazette, <laughs> who will be competing in the 800 meters. And that's also an yeah. uh, interesting one because we don't have long distance runners. We also have one uh, runners from the, in the 1,500 meters. Of course, uh, the, uh, athlete, the athletes will be representing Nigeria mm -hmm. in that particular one. And different other events from Nigeria at the 54 man squad that's a big squad from nigeria there's no excuse not to finish tops in athletics no definitely there's no excuse and our record shows over the years um the major crop of our uh, medals gold medals to be precise have all come from athletics so we lead in that aspect when it comes to the history the Kenyans are coming um, up yeah definitely they're coming up Even but the you, short distance yeah races, yeah coming but up. short distance races the 800 meters and the one five and the three thousand yes that's where you expect them to excel but don't forget the ugandans honestly the ugandans have invested so much in their athletes um, in every aspect of sports don't be surprised if you see them shoot up in the middle distance races all right, wait to find out when it comes uh, on Monday. Yes, uh, that's it on your screen. Uh, talking about the Nigeria representatives uh, coming up in athletics from the track to the field event. And uh, one lady, Toby Loba Musa, uh, some people call her Toby Express. Uh, we're hoping to see how much of her uh, uh, speed she will bring into uh, the competition, which, of course, uh, will start on Monday. All right, we'll go on a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking football, football, football. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, still watching In The Game on New Central TV. And let's go straight to the world of football to talk about the Black Stars of Ghana. Let's not forget, after Coach Oto, Oto Ado was announced as the manager of the uh, Black Stars of Ghana, he went on to uh, introduce and uh, to release his backroom staff. Now, the backroom staff, interestingly, comprises of uh, ex-internationals, uh, players who have played for the Black Stars of Ghana in the past. Talking about uh, the goalkeeper, Fatou Dauda, and lots of Nigerians who know the goalkeeper. He once uh, kept for Iba International in Aba. He has been named as the goalkeeper coach for the Black Stars of Ghana. Also, teammate John Pantil, and uh, uh, he would also uh, be part of the squad, not also forgetting German trained tactician Joseph Lawman would also be part of them. By the way, Lawman arrives with huge coaching experience, having worked with uh, Standard Liège and VFL Bochum in Belgium and Germany, respectively, before having a stint at Barnsley in the uh, English Championship. And of course, Pencil had a brief coach stint in South Africa, where he was a stand coach at PSL side Kaiser Chiefs. A quite fantastic uh, squad for the Black Stars, having to have goalkeepers, you know, backroom staff who are currently on. Uh, you know, important jobs in the career for uh, Fatah Odada, who was once with Sudan. And now talking about Pentil in South Africa, shows that they mean business. Definitely. And I'll start with this. It's a good blueprint for Nigeria. If we're take, if we're, <laughs> honestly, if we're thinking about taking a local coach and thinking about what the backroom staff should be like, it's a great example for Nigeria. But, you know, focusing on Ghana, this is good for them, considering the fact that in the last couple of years they've um, had a, a, a foreign coach and they thought going into AFCON that Chris Hutton would probably take them to the okay. promised land, but that wasn't the case. Now they're reverting back to um, home talent. 
and it, it's good for me because I take a look at the backroom staff. These are former players who have been there for Ghana. They know what it means to represent the Black Stars. They've taken Ghana to certain heights before in the past. And I think Ghanaian football is, is currently in a phase whereby they, they are hungry and they are desperate for silverware because they've got a whole lot of t talented footballers in every aspect of the field. Players playing their trade in Europe, doing so well for their country, for their clubs. But when it comes to the Black Stars, they seem to fall short when it matters the most. All right, I had a conversation with uh, some Ghanaian journalists in the past, and they said it's not just about having a coach in the team, but there's a problem in the Ghanaian squad. You know the problem? The are you brothers? Mm. Now they pointed mm -hmm. out that uh, the coaches cannot do anything without their opinions and what they have to say. That some of the things you see happen, there are factions in the Ghanaian, according to reports, there are factions in the squad. There's a faction of the Thomas Partey, there's a faction of the Andre Ayu brothers. That if that is not being dealt with, if you bring a Jose Mourinho into that team, he may also struggle. So, yes, it's fantastic to have these players, uh, ex players coming to the team, but don't you think it's beyond that, having to deal with the internal crisis? Because, of course, it was seen also at the just concluded AFCON in Cote d'Ivoire. Well, first of all, looking at the personalities of the individuals who have been brought on board, Otoado, Joseph Pansel, and, and Dauda himself, um, these were players who, on the pitch for me during their time, were very vocal players. Now, being a coach is something totally different. If, indeed, the Ayu brothers seem to be huge personalities within the camp, as a coach, you've got two options, in my own opinion. If, if the route of taking these players out of the team is not going to work, because obviously it will be to your disadvantage because these are talented there's, there's players. There's on the side. Of course, of course. <laughs> but, but, but then again... You have another route to go. You can put an arm around these players, work together with them, so that the coach, um, rather, so that the team has synergy and there is a bit of okay. comfort for everyone. And for you know, there, there's also this, this bit of um, the players who who were not born and bred in Ghana, who are who were um, who, I mean born and bred outside of the country. When they come into the national team, they seem not to really gel um, with um, the home base players, or rather, players who came out from Ghana and later okay. went to Europe. Look. In a bit to create synergy around the team, it's best you bring the leaders together and make decisions together so that the team would be, should I say, a big family. All right, a big family. By the way, the Black Stars of Ghana will face Nigeria and Uganda in an international friendly in Marrakesh, Morocco. And of course, we'll wait to see how it goes for Nigeria. We're still here to, uh, uh, the NFF is still here to release or to name a coach for the Super Eagles. For the Black Stars of Ghana, they have also done their part. That's the uh, list, uh, the score players invited for the friendlies. Lawrence Atigi, Atizigi, an uh, important uh, goalkeeper in the team. Joseph Wolakot, uh, one man who stopped Nigeria from qualifying to the uh, 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. The defenders, uh, interesting, Tarek Lamte, pray for Brighton and Albion, important player. Not also forgetting Jiku, Alexander Jiku, fantastic player also when it comes to the defense. Daniel Amate, you all know him, uh, former Leicester City player. And not forgetting Mohamed Salisu, midfielders, we have Mohamed Diomande. Andre Ayu is in the squad. Mohamed Kudus. A uh, fantastic man, doing a lot for West Ham United. Babai Drisu and Edmond Addo. Straight to uh, the uh, forwards. Uh, when you talk about the forwards, you also talk about uh, you know, the absence of uh, Naki Williams, who is not there. But in respective of that, we have Jordan Ayu and uh, Antoine Semeyo. You remember what he did you know, just some days ago for... Um, oh, uh, Bournemouth. A, Bournemouth. Yeah, Bournemouth. Yeah, Bournemouth. Yeah, Bournemouth. It was fantastic for AFC Bournemouth. Let's see what happens come at uh, the international friendlies. Away from there now to the Nigerian Premier Football League. We'll be having interesting fixtures later today. And uh, interestingly, one of the fixtures would make headlines, talking about the Southwest Derby, but on the screens, uh, Abia Warriors will take on Sunshine Stars, Gumbi United against Aqua United, Sporting Lagos, uh, the Noisy Lagos Chance will be up against Quara United, Eima International will be up against Naja Tornadoes, Bendel Insurance against Doma United, Rivers United will be at home against Heartland FC, Shooting Stars against Rebel Stars, the biggest uh, fixture today. That's talking about the Southwest Derby. And Bayasa United will take on Canopilas. Not forgetting Enugu Rangers will be at home to Lobby Stars. That game could uh, tell how the table looks at the end of the day. And uh, Katsina United will be up against Plateau United. Rebel Stars, Shooting Stars against Rebel Stars. Mega Ogumote against Daniel <laughs> Ogumodidi. Definitely. I, I think it's going to be a tactical battle. These are games that I love to watch live a lot. And, you know, talking about uh, Daniel Ogumodidi, he's someone who is very, very animated on the sideline. Obviously, he wasn't happy um, losing the, the first Southwest Derby um, two match days ago, losing to Sporting Lagos, coming to Lagos, coming to the noisy neighbors and losing. Going into this derby, he'll be looking forward to making a statement because these games mean a lot to the fans. So I'm looking forward to what the table is going to look like at the end of this match. And shooting stars coming from an away win, the first away win of the season against Doma United. 
coming to Ibadan to play. That would be a morale booster for them. And Daniel uh, Bega Gubote was once the coach of Remo Stars. Let's take a look at the table, what it says at the moment, the top six, and of course, uh, the bottom six uh, in the NPFL. We have Lobby Stars still top in the table, 46 points. Batu United second with 44 points, and Ugo Rangers third. We have Remo Stars in the mix in number four position. Not forgetting Ayimba International and the Kano Pillars. Then the bottom six. And, and relegation battle right there for the bottom six. We have Quara United in 15. They go away to Sporting Lagos. Rivers United have a standing matches to play. Aqua United in number 17. Bayesa United number 18. Heartland FC number 19. And Gumbi United number 20. Away from there now to the Ghana Premier League. Where of course we'll have games to go down today in different parts of Ghana. Edwana Stars will take on Ashanti Kotoko. Betcham United against Legon City's Bibiana Gold Stars. will be up against Bufokwa Tano. Dreams FC against Samra Tex. Karela against Real Tamale, not forgetting Nations FC against Berakul Chelsea, Satriman against uh, Mediama FC in that uh, particular one. Interesting features to watch out for. Away from there now to the South African Cup, where we had some games played uh, yesterday. Chippa United uh, won against Ravens, two goals to one. Richards Bay lost to Super Sports United, three goals to one. And Lado Pir uh, Pirates trashed Hungry Lions. It's not surprising. Your team is Hungry Lions, <laughs> and uh, you were not hungry for goals. Rather, you, you got more goals. Could it be a name working against them? Definitely. It, it has to be bad luck there for them. All right, bad luck for them. And the fixtures to expect today, the general will take on TS Galaxy. Uh, Mamelodi Saunders against uh, Marisbo United. Away from the African continent, now to Europe, precisely England, where we saw a fixture that a lot of persons, especially the bookmakers, did not... Uh, find it funny, uh, especially that game talking about Fulham and Tottenham Hotspur, but the results on your screen, Burnley, I mean, did everything possible to trash, uh, to win Brentford, two goals to one. By the way, Brentford had a red card in that game. Luton Town played at the 1-1 against Nottingham Forest. It was a comeback in that one to get a point. And uh, Tottenham Hotspur uh, missed a chance to move into the Premier League top four as Rodrigo Miniz scored two more goals to fire Fulham to an impressive victory at a crabbing cottage. Meanwhile, Brazilian Muniz found the net either side of Sasa. Lukic's first strike for the Cottagers to take his total to seven goals in the past seven games. Now, Fulham trashing Tottenham or Spore. Yes, it's a London derby, but for Tottenham, it's not been the way they started the season. Definitely. They are highly inconsistent this season. Um, that's been the trend for them. And I think Ange needs to find um, a way to curb that and to stop that from happening because if you do want to be competitive, look, the Premier League gets competitive every year, year okay. in, year out. You've got teams um, creeping up I I into the top half of the table, the likes of Brighton, the likes of West Ham and whatnot. So okay. if Spurs want to maintain that top six status that they still have for now, they need to be a bit more consistent in the league. All right. Uh, let's go straight to the game we'll have today, the Premier League, uh, where West Ham United... Uh, would be in action today and uh, take on Aston Villa right here at the London Stadium. Away from the Premier League, now to the FA Cup. Manchester City, I mean, were victorious as they cruise into the FA Cup semi-finals with a comfortable victory over Jadel and disappointing Newcastle United at Etihad Stadium. Now, Pep Guardiola's side remained in contention to repeat last season's historic treble of Champions League Premier League and, of course, uh, FA Cup. And we are barely troubled on the rain last night in Manchester. I mean, for Jose Guardiola, he's on the verge of uh, doing the treble. Is, is it possible? Or would you think he would do it? Well, it, it's possible. They did it last year. Who was to say they can't do it again? It's a different again. squad in terms of the charisma, the character. True, true. But at the end of the day, it's still the same Pep Guardiola. This is one Pep that knows how to revitalize his team. He always believes in once you've won major accolades, refresh the team. So he knows what he's doing okay. by refreshing the team. Yeah, they might be a bit shaky in the Premier League in terms of consistency. Not having Kevin De Bruyne out for um, a major part of the season has been a problem for them. They are not so smooth. But you see, one thing about this Manchester City team, they know how to grind out victories. And if they need to do that till the end of the season, I'm not going to put it past them. All right, we'll wait to find out how it goes. Now, let's go straight to the result. It was not just about uh, Manchester City. We also had over Hampton Wanderers, uh, the loss to Coventry City, three goals to two. That's an upset. I mean, when you look at a top table team and then a second division team playing against themselves, definitely it's an upset. Yeah, definitely. But um, I think Wolves needed to have done their homework. But I believe Gary O'Neill did do that. But Coventry City has been a team who has been playing brilliantly in the championship. They've given um, a loss to Leicester City, who at that time before the fixture, Leicester okay. was unbeaten. Coventry was the one that um, broke that duck for them. And they've got some interesting young players. And over the years, Coventry has been, should I say, um, they've been producing some top players, like the likes of Victor Jokeres, currently okay. sporting Lisbon. And currently, they've got great players uh, in their ranks. One striker, Sims from Everton. 
So, yeah, they are good so far. All right, let's quickly go straight to the results, uh, to the fixtures for today. Chelsea will take on Leicester City. Manchester United, a big clash against Liverpool. Away from England to Spain, results from uh, Saturday. Mallorca won against Granada FC, one goal to nothing. It was Osasuna who lost at home to Real Madrid, four goals to two. Getafe won against Girona, one goal to nothing. And Athletic Bilbao got the better of Alaves, two goals to nothing. And later today, we'll see Sevilla against Celta Vigo, Las Palmas against Almeria, Villarreal against Valencia, Real Valencia against Betis. Atletico Madrid will be up against uh, Barcelona. That's a big clash at the Wanda Metropolitano. Away from there to the Italia Serie A. Interesting fixtures from uh, Saturday. It was uh, Monza who got the better of Cagliari, one goal to nothing. Udinese lost to Torino, two goals to nothing. And Salaritana lost to Lecce, one goal to nothing. And Frosinone uh, who lost to Lazio, three goals to two. And later today, we'll get to see Juventus against Genoa, Verona against AC Milan. AS Roma against Sao Solo, Atalanta against Fiorentina, Inter Milan will take on Napoli in that particular one. All right, interestingly, that's how it is. And uh, to wrap up sports update, let's go straight to the world of tennis, where, of course, at the Indian Wells, it was Carlos Alcaraz who ended Yannick Sinner's 19 match on beating run uh, to move straight into the finals of the Indian Wells to set up a meeting with Danny Medvedev. All right, uh, that was, of course, Carlos Alcaraz. Big finals upon us, Danny Medvedev against. Uh, Carlos Alcaraz. Definitely big one to look forward to. Um, a lot of people are probably tip Alcaraz considering okay. um, his ranking so far. But irrespective of that, look, it, it's a final and both men want to win. So may the best Put man Put your win. money on. Uh, Alcaraz, actually. Oh, Alcaraz. Yes, Alcaraz. You don't see an upset? No, I don't see an upset happening. All right. We're going to find out how it goes. Uh, talking about the Indian Wells final. And uh, we have come uh, to the end of today's edition of uh, In The Game. It's been an amazing time. We want to, of course, uh, say thank you for creating our time to uh, build us, of course, on the show. In The Game returns on Monday by 1 p.m. local time. And favor, Itua, and of course, I did the show with uh, Ope Adebari. Enjoy yourself.